Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. So we often hear that React Native is slow, right? That it cannot be as performant as true native code. We also hear that React Native is not really made for the web. Well, today, I want to change the narrative and show you with a very practical example how we can, with a single code base, build hyper-performant apps for native and web that not only is as performant as native, but also much, much pleasant to develop. I'm Kim Schwar, the CTO of Odyssey Music, and we spent the last few months building Odyssey Play. It's a multi-platform um, music learning game where you can learn some wind instruments. We ran into a few challenges, <clears throat> and I want to explain to you how we solve them and um, make sure that hopefully you can learn from it. So the basic of our application is this playing interface where we give the user some notes and we give them feedback on whether they played it on time or not. The user are using our travel sax. It's an electronic saxophone. I don't know if you can see, but there's a lot of keys in there. So for beginners, where we are giving them feedback on whether they played the right keys or not. But here's a hick. We have to keep up with the tempo, right? If our app delays or lags for even a millisecond, then everything is out of tempo, and we've done everything for nothing. It's useless. So for us, the first challenge is it needs to be 60 FPS and no lag no matter what. And we're talking about a game. Right? So we want the experience to be engaging, exciting, and motivating. And we want that to be coherent across all our devices, from web to iOS and Android. And last but not least, we want to take the universal approach. So we want one single code base that powers all those different um, uh, platforms. So as I show you how we fix those two first problems, I always keep the third one in mind. So, Let's see how we can build this game engine. You see it on the right here? It's a basic, um, we're going to focus on the notes and the animation. So here we have some basic React Native code with a note scene that has uh, the notes that basically fetch the notes from a Redux store and map on them to display the notes. Let's first look at how we can animate the scene. So a basic approach would be to use uh, React Native, so we don't have to install another library, and it doesn't improve our um, bundle size. So you, I show you here, you just um, use a reference, you uh, create your animation style, and you just pass it as a style. Great. But here where it gets tricky. We have only one thread available to us. It's a JavaScript thread. So it creates everything, it gets everything ready, and the animation starts. So when the user plays the notes, what's happening is the animation is powered by the GS thread. And when we receive a note that we need to render, guess who's going to handle that? The GS thread. And we might end up in a GS uh, thread overload, which for us is a big no-no, right? It will make lag, and then we're back to zero. So the good news is we can use this use native driver, which gives us access to another thread. It's the UI thread. And what's going to happen is the animation now happens in another thread, which frees up completely the JS thread so that when the user plays the notes, we can handle it. Even if he gets a freak and he plays a lot of them, we'll be good. We're covered. Uh, but not really, actually. Because with this, we can't uh, update everything. So if we, are, we need to update any layout properties, we can't uh, do it. And also, we're still dependent on the JS thread to start, stop, or um, control our animations. And that's when a reanimating come in, comes in the picture. So it's the same approach. You just pass uh, the animated style to uh, your view. But um, the API is a bit more intuitive. And the beauty of this is we get the UI thread, but we have no limit. We can control everything. And also, everything is controlled from the UI thread. So you can have work legs. You can make computation which, again, for us, keeps the GS thread open so we can handle all the different nodes and make sure that everything is OK. So Drake is happy, or maybe Kendrick, whoever is best is going to be proud of us. So now that we got our animation right, things are moving on the right order, let's figure out what we're moving, the nodes. 
And it's basically just a circle with a rounded rectangle. We could use a simple view, but it's going to introduce some layout like a complexity that's going to be a bit useless for us. So to fix this and to be as performant as possible, the answer lies in the answer of this question. What does your brother, browser, phone, and tablet have in common, whether it's iOS, Android, Chrome, you name it? The rendering engine, which is amazing. We finally have something in common. Like They're all using Skia to render everything on the screen. But the bad news is, in order to use this, you have to compile everything, and it's very low-level code, which for us JavaScript princess is a bit too much. Luckily, <coughs> William Candillo and Steam um, brought us Kia, and everything is available with a very nice and simple API with like, um, components that we know and, and love. So let's look at it. Basically, you just need to write your notes into a Canva to be able to draw on it. And then it's as simple as it gets. You get a group, you draw a circle in a certain position, and run a rectangle, and voila. Everything is rendered on uh, straight to Skia. Let's talk about rendering, actually, for a second. So when the user plays the note, uh, or uh, queue gets updated, which means that the notes get re-rendered, because it has new information to, to render. And so that was our first note, which is great. But here's the hick. All of our notes get re-rendered. Some of you get, might get familiar with this. And this is not fine, because we might have like thousands of notes to re-render, and it's going to lag. And again, that's a big no-no. Luckily, memoization can come to the rescue. It's just a React concept we can import, and we have to wrap our note element into a, a memo function. And then only what this does is um, the component only re-renders if it's props change, not if a parent re-render. Uh, so this way, when the player is second note, only one note updates. And you know, I kind of wish this was done by default. But as you might have heard, spoiler alert, that thanks to the React compiler, hopefully with React 19, things will get a bit more in order. But until then, just be careful of re renders. Here's another challenge we face. <clears throat> As I said, we potentially, and this is not the end, and this goes long, long, long. We potentially have like thousands of nodes to play. And so when we initially render things, not only it takes forever, but animating all those puppies is very slow. Where at the end of the day, we're only looking at a few nodes at the same time. So what if we only render what's in the viewport, like we're doing with flashes and such? So we ended up doing that. It's fairly straightforward. You just need to pass in the reanimated values so you know where you're at in your animation. You create a note in viewport queue. You map through it to make sure you only uh, select the proper notes. One thing I just want to highlight is when you do so, make sure that uh, the elements you map into, here your notes, have a unique and stable ID so that when uh, the, the array of notes uh, updates, React can keep track and, oh, I've rendered this already and things is very performant. Otherwise, it'll get local, and I can talk from experience. But hey, we're not like doing all this code just for the sake of sitting in our coach and doing some, some code, right? We're doing this to have fun, right? So let me ask you something. How many wants to, to play with the game and really do it yourself? Was that, yes? OK. OK, that's, that, was, that was a three. That was a three. But um, this will be uh, beta opens in July. But I'm not here to talk about the product. I'm here to talk about coding, right? So what about you code it yourself? You can clone Meloskia and experience what it feels like to have that final tech stack. So all this is open source. It's a piano equivalent, so you can have fun and, and see a bit for yourself what it is. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> if you have time tomorrow to check out and want to learn more, we'll talk. Uh, this, you saw some 2.5D animations in here. There's some interesting thing he's been cooking for us. But enough talking about uh, rendering. Let's talk about styling. You see here 
Um, we try to optimize our app looks in different devices. So if we're on the web with the large, um, large screens, it's good to have the menu on the side to show as much as we, as we can. If it gets smaller, a little hamburger menu, and then the tab layout you know and love. To be honest, to do that, we had to do so, some manual work, but there's still some things that we have been able to do automatically, and I want to talk about them. So let's be simple. Let's see how we can style this uh, button in a different way, and what could be the laziest way and the best way to do it, uh, the most efficient way. So the first one is using the Stylesheet API. Again, no extra library. And we pass the style. You probably use this. You know it, so I'm not going to explain how this works. But where it gets tricky is you end up creating a lot of different styles, and you might forget how, where you use the specific style. And you need to be very strict in what, in what you do, and also the, putting the same padding. So things can be a bit incoherent, and you really need to be very, uh, very clear on this. And the, good, the challenge, too, is it's only strict um, styling. If we look at the web, where we can do animation, we can um, apply different styles based on what's going on in the parents, um, you can't do that unless you use native win. And I know it's based on um, a tailwind approach, which can throw a debate on Twitter almost as better as Elon Musk can. But for us, it's very interesting, because it embeds some concepts that are, can be very powerful. So here is the same style. I'm just applying a background. And the good news with this, although you have a big string, you know exactly what style you apply to your component. And here's where it gets interesting. Not only you can customize this a lot with your own colors and your own different styles, but you can apply platform-specific style right into that styling without having some uh, ternary. So here, for example, over is a more of a web approach, so we can apply this for the web. We can apply some native, which is both iOS and Android, so we can have a lot of control to test you know, where our code is and our style is applied. But also, we can apply um, style based on their parents. So here, for example, if I want to color the text red when I hover the bigger button, I can manage those um, different dependencies without leaving the style environment. But where things really blew my mind is with animation. So this is an example from Alex to create um, oh, but, uh, spoiler. OK, you don't see it, but it's fine. There's a button here where basically it's an animation to animate a button. And to create this animation, you would have to um, write all this uh, reanimation code. So it's pretty wordy. I actually had to reduce the size of the font to make it fit. Whereas in native, when you just have to write two lines of code and the button animates. It's the same way in uh, CSS. You apply a transition, you give the transition type the duration, and everything gets compiled in the same hyper-performance code in uh, native um, reanimated that you saw before. So shout out. I think he's here in the audience. But uh, Work at Ship has a great um, interview with Mark Lawler that I found very interesting. So if you want to dive deeper, it's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great resource. It lasts for an hour, so probably put it offline if you're going in the in airplane. But it's worth it. The last thing is we needed to separate front-end UI to um, the, the, the app logics. So for example, if we take this interface that allows us to select the step of our courses, I might want to work in this specific button, right? And make sure that it always looks good in all the different settings. Or I might want to try what happens if I have like a very long text here and without having to change all the data that I have in my app. Or I also want to try and make sure that it looks amazing in all the different platform without having to, to do too much work. And that's when Storybook comes in in the picture and it's been very helpful for us. And amazing, it's not showing up. Ah, voilà. Cool. So basically what this does, it isolates some of the UI components for you. So here I have the button. I see all the different running. I can even check on the phone and make sure that my baguette icon is looking good. Um, so it's very powerful because um, you are able to isolate this, and it's very easy to do. It's you just have to create a story uh, file, and you define uh, you pass in your component, and you pass different type of arguments, and then you can always test it. And when it gets very powerful, is you're able to run some UI test on top of this. So you're sure that as you add new feature and do some changes, you're not breaking anything 
which without those kind of tools will be very hard to do. For us, for example, the interface of the nodes can be very complex to test. But with this, we can push code with like, a lot of um, assurance. So let's summarize it. If you want to build a FPS game engine, uh, a very fast game engine, Skia and Reanimated are very powerful and can really help you do that. Just be careful of your renders or wait for a React compiler. And only draw what you need, right? Make sure you don't do too much. If you want to have a current UIX, um, we got very close to universal thanks to uh, native win. And you can use a compost based uh, approach with Storybook. And use Explorator. I think I, I'm not talking about it because Evan Bacon does it more than I do, but it gives you a lot of coherence uh, concepts from the different platform. But hey, let's be honest. We're not writing unicorns on top of a, of a rainbow. It's not, not everything is perfect. And there's still some challenges that need to be fixed. And I want to cover some of them. First one is setup can be a <clears throat> OK. I'm French, but I'm not going to swear, I, I promise. I probably spent a lot of time in the different uh, setting configs and challenge with uh, a few of those. So what I've done is I've created a few bottle plates for you guys if you want to get started a bit faster. Um, so hopefully you don't have to get into those dark metro alleys. Another thing is we should talk about audio. There's not that much audio library out there for React Native. We've made a lot of progress in a lot of topics. But beside Expo AV, there's not much. And Expo AV can be a bit temperamental. So I'm really excited that in SDK 51, they've improved the V aspect of it with Expo Video. But can we talk about Expo Audio and, and think about it a bit? Let's, can we dream a bit about it? Because it's not only just loading um, sound in an efficient way and controlling it fast. How can we build a synth right? so we can have like generate sound? How can we host like, a machine learning algorithm to generate backing tracks? There's just a lot of things we can do and a big community that's waiting for us. But we need to, to give it access. So if you're working in some of those concepts or you're interested, please come and find me. I would love to collaborate and make sure that we can make this a uh, reality. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Have a good day.